math is a fascinating source of thinking, enrichment, and discovery. We have our early civilizations and historical figures to thank for the discovery of our number system, the root of the vast world of mathematical concepts we are able to learn today. Let's start with the beginning of numbers. The world naturally started with just counting numbers. The first counting system was created by the ancient Sumerians as their civilization advanced and communities formed. They needed a way to keep track of trade and inventory, so they developed a counting system that used carvings, symbols, and columns representing place values. Other civilizations invented their own symbols for numbers as time went on. The Sumerians' early concept of zero existed in the form of a place value without a quantity. For example, in the number 105, the tens place value has nothing, so it's considered empty. They represented this absence of quantity with angled wedges in their counting system. The Mayans also used zero as a place value in their complicated calendar systems. They did not use zero outside of this because they couldn't wrap their heads around the fact that nothing can exist by itself. Around this time in India, zero was communicated with words such as void and sky. Mathematician Brahmagupta developed a symbol for zero, a dot. He also established the rules of using zero in basic math operations. Persian mathematician Noah Rizmi suggested that a circle, which symbolizes emptiness, be used to represent zero. The concept of zero spread to Europe after it was developed by other civilizations. Here's an interesting fact. The Italian government at one point was very suspicious of ideas that may have come from Arabia and they banned the use of zeros. It was continued to be used secretly by merchants and mathematicians such as Fibonacci. Here's another interesting fact. The ancient Greeks were confused about the concept of zero for a while. They asked, how can nothing be something? This opened up a lot of philosophical discussions and debates. The concept of negative numbers already existed in China at this time. They were represented by different colored lines. Indian numerals used decimals since 5th century. They were also already using negative numbers to represent debt at around the 7th century. Brahmagupta established the first set of rules dealing with negative numbers using fortune and debt. These are rules we commonly accept today. India was arguably the first civilization to develop a coherent number system that included a defined decimal point, decimal places, and negative numbers. The Greeks did not acknowledge the concept of negative numbers for a long time since their works revolved around geometry, in which having negative numbers would not make sense. Just like time, a length measurement cannot be a negative number. British mathematician Francis Masseris, who lived in the 18th century, still rejected negative numbers because they make dark of the things which are in their nature excessively simple and obvious. Europe rejected the Indian number system for a while. They were afraid of foreign ideas and they wanted validation that their own works were good enough without any outside influences. Here's an interesting fact. Math involving decimals was punishable when the church controlled Europe. Europeans continued using Roman numerals and counting tables, which showed their lack of appreciation for mathematical progress. Rational numbers are numbers that can be written as a fraction where the denominator cannot equal zero. 4,000 years ago, the Babylonians were using fractions. They extended their natural number system to a sexagesimal system to include fractions. The sexagesimal system was similar to our current base 10 system, consisting of place values like hundredths, tenths, ones, tens, hundreds, and so on, except their system had 60 as a base. Numbers that were greater than 1 had place value of 60s, 3600s, and so on. Numbers lower than 1 had place value of 60ths, 3600ths, and so on. We use the system today for hours and angles. Ancient Egyptians used unit fractions, which are fractions with 1 as the numerator. The system was not perfect, as some values need to be written as a sum of unit fractions. 
Fractions were also useful in their daily lives. A quarter bushel of wheat, half a gold bar, a third bag of apples were all practical applications of rational numbers. In Greece, works of mathematicians such as Pythagoras and Euclid were involved in the use of ratios. However, their findings were limited because their work was mostly based on geometry. Fractions were not useful when measuring length, area, or volume. Irrational numbers are numbers that cannot be written as a fraction, such as pi. Greek philosopher Hippasus discovered that not all numbers can be represented by a ratio. Using the Pythagorean theorem, he discovered that in some cases, the length of the hypotenuse could not be written as a fraction, which led to the creation of irrational numbers. His proof went as follows. If root 2 could be written as a fraction, the numerator and denominator could not have a common factor because it would have to be fully simplified. He isolated p and found out that it had to be even since anything multiplied by 2 becomes even. Since p was even, he could write it as 2a. By isolating q, he again found that it was an even number. Since both p and q are even numbers, they have a common factor of 2, which contradicts his first statement that the numerator and denominator could not have a common factor. Thus, root 2 is not a rational number. So who discovered pi? The first estimation came from Archimedes, who wanted to find the ratio between the circumference and the diameter of a circle. Since he couldn't measure the perimeter, he found the perimeter of two polygons, one drawn outside the circle and one drawn within. Using these two numbers, he could determine the range of the circumference. By increasing the number of side lengths, it gave smaller and smaller ranges. Eventually, he used a 96-sided polygon and got a value that was very close to pi. Problems involving the root of negative numbers have puzzled mathematicians for centuries. How could the square of a real number equal a negative? Finding the roots of certain equations was nearly impossible with the limitations of real numbers. It wasn't until the 1500s that a new number system was created to solve these problems. The very idea of imaginary numbers was unfathomable for most minds. Famous Italian mathematician Girolamo Cardano referred to working with these numbers as mental torture. Amongst all the skeptics, Raphael Bombelli was one of the only mathematicians that felt comfortable with the idea of imaginary numbers. Known as the inventor of complex numbers, he created the first set of rules when dealing with these numbers. He referred to square root negative 1 as plus of minus and negative square root negative 1 as minus of minus. Further down the line, Caspar Wessel developed a new plane, known as the complex plane, on which complex numbers could be graphed. For numbers of the form a plus or minus bi, the x-axis represents a, while the y-axis represents bi. This made it a lot easier for people to accept their existence. So how does this connect to our course? Without the innovation and discovery of the number systems, our enriched course would be reduced to an elementary class since the advanced concepts we learn in this course use a vast variety of types of numbers. We often use all rational numbers to identify domain and range. We're able to study imaginary roots with complex numbers. We don't question the use of negative numbers and zeros because they've already been established and validated by historical mathematicians. The evolution of math throughout the ages has proved that there are limitless possibilities in the realm of numbers. Through the discoveries of ancient civilizations and intellectual individuals, we've been able to push boundaries and progress rapidly. We've merely scratched the surface of our understanding of math. Who knows what the future holds?